Thank you very much, Carol. That's extraordinarily helpful. You've reminded me of things that I'd forgotten about my career. And um, that was extremely long and very, uh, very exhaustive uh, kind of recital of my, uh, of my achievements to date, which of course leaves us with no time to be able to, no, no, not, not, not at all. Hopefully what we'll have is a lot of time to be able to, uh, to think about uh, dementia in context, essentially to be able to think about the particular challenges that are posed by this, uh, this terrible set of illnesses that cause tremendous suffering for individuals, that cause, uh, dementia inevitably causes uh, deterioration in your being able to think and remember and your ability to be able to do things for yourself. That's the core of what dementia is. Dementia is a disease that it just does not respect the boundaries that we place between health care and social care. It affects, um, it affects people with dementia themselves, but also families to a gigantic extent as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to present some, some, some information and data, and I'm going to uh, talk about it in context in terms of, of why it might be particularly difficult and complicated to meet the challenges of dementia. And what I want to do in the end is to kind of bring that back in and then to say just how much we can do and how, how already we are doing things that enable people to live well with dementia. Because I'm immensely excited by the opportunities that we have by the challenges of dementia. I'm immensely excited uh, by the things that we can already do that can enable people with this devastating condition to live well with dementia. I believe that it is absolutely possible for people to live well with dementia, but that, that sometimes needs a bit of help and care. That sometimes needs a bit of help from health services, but also from social services, and it really needs a lot of help from families as well, so that we're all in a position to enable people to live well with dementia, but we're in the, we're in a position where we're just starting to get to understand what some of those are. So I'd, I'd make the case for dementia being certainly a great 21st century health and social care challenge, if not the great health and social care challenge of the 20th century. And this is the reason why we have a set of challenges of dementia. This is a graphic from the World Health Organization, essentially showing population aging over the years from 2015 to 2050. And the problems that we have with dementia are entirely driven by the fact that the world's population is getting older. Okay? So this is absolutely to do with the success that we've had. The success that we've had in terms of building and developing um, services that have enabled people to live beyond middle age and into later life. So the fantastic work that was done with um, nutrition and with, uh, and with sanitation, for example, at the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century, right through to improvements in the quality of care that we provide to uh, younger children, for example, with improvement of, of maternity services, right through to um, uh, cleaning up our workplaces so that people are less exposed to things like asbestos and toxic, uh, and toxic work environments that killed people in middle life. And then in the middle of the 20th century, our successes in terms of understanding heart disease and understanding cancer and the fact that people you know, live so much longer, okay, you know, it is no longer a, uh, a death sentence for an individual to have a diagnosis of cancer. People, we are able to treat those illnesses, individuals are able to live with those illnesses. And so what we have alongside the public health improvements that we've made in, uh, for example, uh, nutrition and exercise and not smoking, decreasing smoking, for example. What that has meant is that we have been fantastically successful at enabling people to live longer. And one of the consequences of people living longer 
as you see, is that uh, the numbers go up of people living longer, which is our success, but it means that people are living to those ages where the diseases of aging, the long-term conditions of aging, and dementia is a great exemplar of that. Dementia is very uncommon. Of course, it happens in some unfortunate cases of people under the age of uh, 60 or 65. It happens uh, particularly in people, uh, pe people who have Down syndrome can develop dementia at an earlier stage. And young onset dementia is a particularly difficult and complicated thing to deal with. But the vast majority of people with dementia are in their 70s and 80s and 90s. So it is absolutely a, uh, a the, the fact that we have more cases of dementia is a, is a symptom of the success that we have had in terms of dealing with those illnesses that used to kill people in midlife. Um, and, uh, and that is why we have a growth in the numbers of dementia, for people with dementia. So there are about 10 million cases worldwide, new cases of dementia per year. That's one every three seconds. Dementia is a big problem. If you look at the numbers, we have about 50 million people with dementia now. By 2050, that's projected to rise to 152 million people. So this is a, so there are already more people in the world with dementia than there are with HIV AIDS, for example. And the policy priorities haven't aligned to that in the past. And fascinatingly, if you look at where cases of dementia are and where they're growing in the world, if you look at that last diagram that we put up there, you saw that uh, India and China were getting darker during that time. And the immense population growth in those areas and of older people in India and China, in those areas that are most populous, means that it is already the case that most people, about 66% of people with dementia, live at the moment in low and middle income countries, and that will only grow. So this is a worldwide issue. This isn't an issue just for the developed world. This is an issue for the world as a whole. And one of the reasons why all over the world um, systems and are uh, are waking up to the challenge of dementia is not only that there's a lot of it about and that those numbers are growing so that within a generation we will have a doubling of the numbers of people with dementia, but the costs are very high as well. The dementia is already a trillion dollar illness uh, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2019. And uh, by 2030, that will double. There's an immense amount of money that is spent on managing people with dementia and not managing them very well in many cases. And you see along the bottom, you see along the bottom here, uh, the differences between low middle income countries, sorry, low income countries, low and middle income countries, up to high income countries like Canada at the end there. And you'll see that uh, in, 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 in high income countries, you have a split with half of the money being spent on dementia being, uh, being from health services and social services, are often spent on long-term care for individuals, sometimes with that care being of relatively poor quality as well. So spending a large amount of money on relatively poor quality care for people with dementia, but about half of it also being the work that families do to support people with dementia. And that is uh, costing families at the minimum wage for whatever country that they might be in rather than looking at the real opportunity costs. Families do an immense amount uh, to help and support people with dementia and without those families, uh, they are the most important element of care wherever you go in the world. And without them, the systems, and systems would uh, break down. And these are data from the United Kingdom. So if you start looking, you start comparing the costs of illnesses, and there's, there are real problems in terms of, of, of cost of illness studies. But if you start looking at what dementia costs compared to other illnesses, then that's it's quite remarkable because of the breadth of impacts of people with dementia. Because, for example, if you go into a care home in the United Kingdom, 90% of people have dementia. Essentially, care homes in the United Kingdom, and I think uh, to a similar extent in, in Canada, are long-term care 
for people with dementia. And that's because, again, we've done brilliant things in social care and brilliant things in healthcare that means that almost all conditions can be managed in people's own homes because that's where most people want to stay. But when you start having the particular challenges of dementia, be that because of behavioral problems in dementia or the disability of dementia or all because you have run out of family members to care for you as you've grown older, Whatever the reason, those are the individuals that the system finds it impossible to deal with and to manage in their own homes and support in their own homes. So they do make that transition into care homes. And if we look at dementia, it's about twice the cost of cancer services. And actually, if you were to add cancer and heart disease together in the UK, then that would only just about approximate to the costs per year of dementia care in the United Kingdom, which is around 25 billion pounds per year now. And if you look at the priorities that have been set for health, and if you look at the spends in terms of health in the United Kingdom, there are, it is remarkable how little health systems spend on people with dementia compared to those with cancer or those with heart disease. And that's the reasons why, th and, and that's the reason why things are changing. It's not just because of the numbers, it's because of the cost. And there are real reasons to be cheerful and optimistic. This is uh, uh, the growth of the numbers of publications on Alzheimer's disease per decade. And you'll see that in the 1960s, there was just a handful. In the 1970s, just 290. In the 2000s, there were uh, there was something getting up to 40,000, and there'll be more than three or four times that amount in the de in this decade. We know a lot more about dementia than we used to. We know a lot more about Alzheimer's disease, and that's right across the piece. So yes, that's in terms of basic science and the causes of Alzheimer's disease. But it's also through to an understanding of how uh, you know, socially we might care for people better and in policy terms, what we might do to help people. So right across that, uh, that spectrum from, uh, from cause to cure to care, we're starting to know more about people with dementia. And you know, these, these hundreds of thousands of papers that are now published about, about Alzheimer's disease, they're, you know, not all of them are full of brilliant and wondrous information. You know, many of them are profoundly dull and uninteresting, and I know that because I've written many of them. <laughs> but amongst that, there are real insights. There are really important things that are changing, and it's not changing quickly enough. We haven't found you know, the magic cure that will make it go away. And we probably won't because there's probably 20 or 30,000 different ways of genes and environment interacting to be able to give you the phenotype of Alzheimer's disease in the same way as there's 20 or 30,000 ways of ending up with cancers as a whole. But we will learn more and more and we are learning more and more. And, and that will help us not only in terms of <coughs> the treatment of dementia and the prevention of dementia, <clears throat> and I'll share some of that with you uh, in a little, a little later, but also in terms of how we care for people. So the first reason to be cheerful is that we just know so much more than we did before. And one of the things that we start to know is how we can um, think about improving things for people with dementia. And if you look at... Um, <clears throat> If you look at analyses of the challenges of dementia that exist out there, <coughs> they tend to find three things that you need to do. The first being to improve public and professional attitudes and understanding. The second, to be able to improve the quality of, of diagnosis and to diagnose people earlier so that people know that they've got dementia. And the third, to improve the quality of care and treatment that's received from diagnosis right through to the end of life. And those would be three things that most uh, dementia strategy share. So let's start with that first. This is, uh, these are front pages from one particular not very good newspaper in the United Kingdom. In fact, it's a terrible newspaper, but you'll see here just how often dementia gets onto the front page. And, and, and why does dementia get onto the front page of the Daily Express 
quite soft. If you actually look at the things that it says, <coughs> they are slightly contradictory at times. A daily drink to beat dementia, that's fine, I'm happy with that one. And, some, and sometimes it's that, 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 uh, that if you can drink, drink tea to fight dementia, that's quite nice. And you can have chocolate and that'll stop it, and coffee. So you have to have tea, coffee, chocolate, and alcohol, and then you'll be fine. <coughs> or you can lose weight, or you can stay active, or there's a news. Why are there so many front pages that have dementia on there? It's because there's a gigantic hunger out there for information on dementia. And it's not only a hunger for the magic treatment that will make it go away, and some of these front pages allude to new cures around the corner, and when you actually look at the evidence, it's, you know, it's three mice in California that have received something, and it's a long way away from that treatment actually being here. But you know, newspapers know that things sell. They know what sells, and dementia sells because people are concerned and are worried about it. And there's a real hunger out there for good quality information on dementia. And the, the rise of the Alzheimer's societies around the world has been a really positive thing in enabling uh, the voice of those people that are affected by dementia, but also uh, those who care for people with dementia to be articulated and to start providing good quality, believable information out there. And if you start to analyze how you might approach public and professional attitudes and understanding, you start to realize that there are, so you can't see those things there, so I'll let, me, let me explain them to you. So there are false beliefs that are out there that stop people from asking for help and stop people from offering help. There's a stigma out there of dementia in various places and often felt most acutely by older people themselves that stops people talking about it or that stops families from bringing up the issues. So one of the uh, things that, uh, that, that, has been, that is powerful are, are public education messages that, at, that address the stigma of dementia. There's uh, false beliefs out there, the false belief that dementia is a normal part of aging. It's not. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. Even if you get to the age of 85, 90, it's only a third of people that will have a dementia of whatever cause. And that means two thirds of people don't have it. It is not a normal and natural part of aging. It is, however, associated with age, just as very many illnesses are. So age is an important risk factor. It is not the cause of dementia. And most toxic of all is the one in the bottom here, the idea that nothing can be done. So you have this idea that in the absence of the magic chemical that makes it go away, that there's nothing that can be done about dementia, so we shouldn't bother. And that's an immensely toxic thought. And it is true that we do not have drugs that can reverse dementia. But we have so much that we can do to enable people to live well with that illness. And the, uh, the model of disease treatment that says that if you don't have something to make it go away, you haven't got anything, hasn't been, the dominant, hasn't been dominant and important for the last 50 years. Yes, we have, uh, you know, we have antibiotics that make drugs, make some things go away, and we have treatments for some cancers that make them go away, and that's great. But most of modern medicine and healthcare is based upon the treatment of long-term conditions and maximizing health and enabling good quality of life with people living with those long-term conditions. And that's precisely what we can do in, in dementia. But what you have is that you have these false beliefs, stigma and false beliefs about it being a natural part of aging and nothing being done, causing inactivity, uh, both in seeking help and in offering help. And there are simple things that some countries have done in order to address that. So in Japan, for example, Japan has the oldest population in the world, and so has the largest per capita number of people with dementia in the world. They also have a culture of filial piety, which means being respectful of older people as well, which is great. Um, however, it was very difficult to reconcile that with some extraordinarily poor quality of care that appeared to be given to older people in dementia. There were very large 
uh, and in personal care homes with very high levels of physical restraint, with individuals essentially being uh, bound to beds. And that was a, a, a normal way of treating people uh, 15 years ago. And so in 2004, the Japanese government decided that one of the things that was getting in the way was that it was very difficult to talk about dementia and to be respectful of older people if you used the word for dementia. So the word chiho was a mixture of idiocy and, and stupidity. So you were essentially being disrespectful even by mentioning the word. And so, you know, as they can do in Japan, they changed the word to ninchinso, which is a neutral term meaning cognitive disorder. And within three years, they had three million people who had volunteered to be dementia friends within Japan. And the whole atmosphere and attitude to dementia in Japan uh, changed. And their orange plan, their national dementia strategy, is a, is a real exemplar of really ambitious and really effective interventions across the board to enable people to live well with dementia. And one of those uh, is the, and one of those elements is uh, their Nincenzo friends, which I, I believe is the, the happy donkey for some reason. So it's a happy donkey in Japan for you, to, for you being a dementia friendly community or a dementia friendly hospital or a dementia friendly country. And there are equivalents across the world. I think Dementia Friends is the Canadian equivalent, which, is also, which uh, was then stolen by the United Kingdom. So we've rolled it out to about 2 million people in the UK. And they're a dementia-friendly nation. So these, this focus on providing environments that actually become environments where it is possible to be with, de to have dementia and for it not to matter so much. So that people understand, uh, and most of these Dementia Friends programs involve giving a small amount of good quality information to people either via the internet or via, via a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, discussion with, in a group or with other people, done in schools, it's done in all sorts of places. And it just enables people to be a bit more confident and a bit more well-informed about dementia so that it doesn't seem so monstrous and so it becomes something that people uh, understand that they can do something to help with. Second thing that, so that's, public and professional attitudes and understanding improving. It's important uh, to think of both, uh, both uh, the medical and the nursing professions having those improved understandings. And we'll come back later to uh, some ways that we might go about doing that. But better diagnosis of dementia is absolutely important as well. If you're going to go from having these problems to being able to do something about them, then generally you need to know what's going on. And Worldwide, if you look at diagnosis rates for dementia, you'll find that more people with dementia don't know that they've got it and are undiagnosed than have than do know that they've got it and are diagnosed. Our systems are not necessarily optimized to enable people to go from having worrying symptoms to knowing what's going on. And so, again, all over the world, you have this uh, you have this issue that when people are diagnosed, it's generally late in the illness, and that may be when it's too late to enable people to make choices. And choice is, a very, is very often what governs the quality of life of individuals. So too late to enable choices to be made, too late to prevent the harms that can accrue in dementia, and too late to prevent those crises that can happen. And so the movement within systems is to move from late and low diagnosis to early and high diagnosis. And this is a very crowded slide from work that we did in the United Kingdom developing um, uh, uh, services that actually work well to diet, that are specific memory assessment services for old people uh, with dementia who, uh, or rather people of all ages with dementia that make the diagnosis well, that communicate that diagnosis well, and then provide people with the care and support that they need. And these services, uh, they, they can be provided at relatively, uh, at relatively small cost. They have the potential to save money by reducing admissions to nursing homes. And there are suggestions that the quality of life of those individuals who receive these services improve. And if you look uh, at uh, the uh, diagnostic rates of dementia in the United Kingdom following the introduction of the National Dementia Strategy, these are data that were published a few years ago in the Lancet Public Health. 
And what they show is that we have doubled the rate of diagnosis of dementia in the United Kingdom. We've gone from about 33% uh, to about 68% of individuals being diagnosed. And we hope that we're also starting to diagnose people earlier and with better quality as well. And one of those quality measures is that individuals are being prescribed with the drugs that are available to treat dementia. There are drugs that are available. They're now very cheap because they are off license. They are of modest benefit to a number of people with dementia that don't stop the illness, but they make the most of what they have. And here we have data that suggests that, the, uh, that, the, that we have way more than doubled the uh, prescription of those drugs to individuals. So people are receiving treatments that are available. But the main and the most important reason why one wants to make the diagnosis, to, be, to, to make it well, to communicate it well, so it can become uh, a source of power for individuals is this, 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 this a, uh, a dichotomy. Some people say, uh, you know, that ignorance is bliss, it's better not to know. And some people say that knowledge is power. I'm very much of the view, having spoken to you know, a lot of people with dementia, having made a lot of diagnoses of dementia and having spoken to those families, I'm very much of the view that, that knowledge is power right? and that ignorance isn't bliss because actually none of the problems go away and many of the solutions are closed to you because of ignorance. And so here we have Francis Bacon, the uh, founder of empiricism. He said that knowledge is power, and I believe that knowledge is power for people with dementia and their families. So the third element of this, which is so much bigger because there's such a world of treatments and interventions that one might have, is about a better prevention and treatment of dementia. So let's think in terms of prevention. So something very interesting is happening across the developed world. We've been doing lots of interesting and useful things for our public health over the last uh, 50 years. And some of that is starting to impact on dementia. So what we have here are two studies. CFAS is the Cognitive Functioning and Aging Studies. These are large epidemiological studies carried out in the United Kingdom on representative groups of uh, people, of older people, and well, basically what they, go, what they do is they go out, they carry out an assessment to see what the age and gender specific rates are of dementia across the, across the piece. And here we have uh, different age groups and the blue ones are CFAS1, which happened uh, in about 19, 1990, and CFAS2, which happened 20 years later. Uh, and that's the pink. And what you'll see is that there is a decrease in the numbers of people in the seven, from 75 upwards uh, with dementia in CFAS2 that we found in CFAS2 compared to CFAS1. And that is remarkable. What that shows is that there's been a decrease only by about 16 or 17 percent. But overall, there's 17 percent fewer people, fewer cases of dementia than we would have expected. Uh, using the data from CFAS1, and that's not because of methodological differences between the two studies. Now, of course, the population has grown of older people during this time, which has more than offset those numbers. So yes, we've had a doubling in the numbers of people with dementia, but there are slightly fewer, 16, 17% fewer than there would have been. And this is likely to be the effect of um, the effect of um, uh, the things that we have been doing to help people's cardiovascular health. So there's a, a saw that people come out with, there, which is what's good for your heart is good for your head. And that's absolutely the case. A large proportion of the risk for Alzheimer's disease, but also for vascular dementia and other forms of dementia comes from cerebrovascular risk. And basically, if you look after your heart, you're looking after your head. And that's likely to be what happens. So stopping smoking, treating diabetes, uh, decreasing obesity, all of those things have led to a decrease, a prevention at a population level, not at an individual level, of the cases of uh, dementia that are out there. So what we have is that we have lifestyle factors that can prevent dementia. But one needs to be very careful when you have modifiable risk factors, 
because you can go the other way as well. And here we have data from China in exactly the same sort of period of time that suggests a doubling in the prevalence of dementia during this time. And this is allowing for the proportionate change in the population. And what's that about? Well, what it's likely to be about is that behaviours have been changing from the worst. I mean, you know, while we have decreased smoking, and I imagine Canada's smoking has gone down in the last 50 years, um, those cigarettes have to be sold somewhere, do they? Otherwise, the poor old tobacco companies start losing money. And so they're being sold in the developing world. And so you have a gigantic, with, with um, a perfectly understandable industrialization and generation of a middle class and with more money being in that system available within China, people choose to use their money on things that they like doing. And what do people like doing? They like smoking, they like drinking, they like eating more meat and those sorts of things. And so you have both an increase in uh, cigarette consumption in China and also an increase in obesity. And these show that the problem that we face with the preventability of dementia is that there are things that we can do that will make it more likely that individuals will uh, and that populations will have a growth in the numbers of people with dementia. And this is a diagram from uh, the Lancet Commission on uh, Dementia Care, Dementia Treatment and Care. And this uh, shows a, a kind of lifestyle, uh, sorry, a life course, this takes a life course approach to risk uh, identifying things like genetics at birth, uh, things like early education being a potentially powerful component for generating more cognitive reserve. So it's a great way of having a more connected brain. The more connected a brain you have, the more insult in terms of a neurodegeneration it takes before your dementia becomes apparent. And there's things in midlife that may also include things like sensory uh, losses, like hearing loss, which may also lead to a less connected brain, as well as hypertension and obesity right through to later life. So it's never too late to start thinking about prevention of dementia in terms of stopping smoking, in terms of treating uh, diabetes, and it's never too early to think about dementia in terms of this life course as well. And if we're looking at improving the quality of care, there's just so much that could be done. These are the, the, uh, the objectives from the UK, uh, sorry, for the National Dementia Strategy for England. So about uh, improving support within people's homes, right through to improving things within general hospitals and care homes, right through to improving end of life care. There's just so much we can do. There are so many areas that we can work to improve things. Just one of those areas uh, is the, this is uh, some work that I did for the, um, for the UK Department of Health, uh, reviewing the use of antipsychotic medications. Antipsychotic medications are often used to control difficult behaviours in dementia, challenging behaviours. And what you have is that you have um, a certain amount of deaths that would not happen in people that did not have dementia. So these drugs have a certain amount of side effects associated with them, including a slightly increased mortality. But if you have dementia, there's an even higher level of mortality that you have. And that's basically about a 1% extra mortality. And so that amounted to 1,800 deaths per year being attributable to these medications. And so what we did was we made it a priority for health systems. We scrutinized health systems in terms of how seriously they were taking this. We made it a clinical governance priority. And here we have data which suggests that the proportion of people prescribed antipsychotic drugs, the proportion of people with dementia prescribed these drugs has more than halved, in the, halved since we produced our report uh, on that. And that's a, that's a positive thing because these drugs are necessary for some cases. They can be, um, they can be the difference between an individual staying in their own homes and being uh, a danger to themselves and others or moving into a care home, for example. Um, but we have managed to decrease the amount of use of these drugs. And so that's uh, essentially saving over, saving about a thousand lives per year by doing that. So I just want to finish by looking at two particular areas, about thinking about how we might conceptualize the challenge of dementia so that we can kind of understand firstly why some of the things that we're doing don't work, and also by thinking about how some of the things that we can do 
might work really rather well. So for me, the challenge of dementia is one of multimorbidity as much as anything else. If you try and separate out a group of people with dementia that only have dementia, then you find that only 17% of people with dementia just have dementia. Dementia, multimorbidity, which is basically having one or more, sorry, two or more long-term conditions at once, uh, is a common phenomena. This is data from um, Scottish primary care uh, data sets. But dementia has the highest level of multimorbidity. Very, very few people with dementia just have dementia. So you start to think about why things might happen together. They can happen by chance, one thing can cause the other, or there might be the possibility of error, of things being different uh, when you have uh, a situation of complexity, which is what multimorbidity is, rather than one of simplicity. So starting with the easy bits, some of our uh, diagnoses, uh, some of the things that cause dementia, like vascular dementia and Lewy body dementia, require you to have another illness. So you can't have vascular dementia without having vascular disease, without having, without having cardiovascular problems as well as cerebrovascular ones. And you can't have Lewy body dementia without having Parkinson's. And Alzheimer's disease essentially suggests that you have nothing else that's causing that, but you often have other illnesses. And we know that multimorbidity is to do with aging as well. Here we see the numbers increasing with age. Most over 65s have two or more conditions. Most over 75s have three or more conditions. And we know that, that multimorbidity has an impact. So it drives the disability that increases with age. It's, it's often not one thing wrong with you that causes that, but two or three things wrong with you makes it much more likely that you go from being able to do something with help to not being able to do anything at all. And if you look into our general hospitals about who our general hospitals are dealing with, then again, it is this multimorbid population. So most admissions, most bed days, most delayed transfers, most of the bad things that happen in general hospital happen to older people. And those are the people with multimorbidity. Uh, general hospitals in the United Kingdom are essentially elderly care facilities that aren't very good at elderly care. Um, and if you look in primary, if you look in general hospitals, that's what you find. But if you look in primary care, you find exactly the same things. So again, people with dementia, this is a, a study from some time ago, uh, have the highest level of chronic medical conditions, prescribed five medications with high levels of hypertension and diabetes. And we see the same thing, the same pattern again and again. If you look at uh, here, the US Health and Retirement Study, again, those with cognitive impairment have the highest level of multimorbidity. And it's true in low and middle income countries as well. These are data from the 1066 networks work in Latin America, and they show that all of the things that, and these data show that uh, if you have dementia compared to not having dementia, you're much more likely to have incontinence, visual impairment, hearing impairment, and that the more severe your dementia, the more likely it is that you'll have those conditions. The only difference being pain there, but that's not because people with dementia have less pain, it's because we're less good at measuring pain from people with dementia, which is why they get half the level of, of, um, of pain relief uh, for every, uh, individuals with dementia who have a, a hip replacement or who break their hip, get half the level of pain relief compared to people that do not have dementia. And that's a sign that sometimes treatment is poorly provided to people with dementia as well. So multimorbidity, it's common in dementia, it's a complex phenomena, and it's often poorly managed. So I'd wanna just take that and take it into looking at neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia, and particularly looking at behavioral and psychological symptoms. We know that they're common in dementia, and the things that drive poor life quality for people with dementia are often things like agitation and anxiety, depression and psychosis and motor overactivity, those sorts of things. And here we have a slide that summarizes treatments that we might use with particular symptoms. And we have uh, the arrows, you know, essentially there is, uh, you know, there's a technical term for this, which is that it is a mess, yes? You can see that everything's being used for everything. And you know, why is that? Is it because as a geriatric psychiatrist, I am essentially very lazy and I can't make up my mind that I just kind of reach into my bag or reach for my prescription pad and just think of any old thing to write down. Now, is it that? Yes. It's not actually, I promise you it's not that. 
But what it is, is that we try one thing and it doesn't work. You know, we try antidepressants for depression and it doesn't work. And we try antipsychotics for agitation and it doesn't work. So because these things are you know, very unpleasant to have. We try more and more and more things. We try different things. We try combinations of things because we're trying to help those individuals. And so what this might suggest is that perhaps some of the certainties that we know in terms of what works for what may not work so well in dementia. So let's explore that with depression in dementia. Depression is the most common uh, uh, is the most common mental disorder in later life. It happens at about 14, 13% of older people have clinically significant depression. We've got about 6% of people with dementia having people with dementia. So you'd expect comorbidity in about 1%, but in fact, about 20% of people with dementia have a depressive illness at any time. So there's something going on between depression and dementia. But we know that it's not a good thing, that it's associated with, uh, with increased death, controlling for uh, uh, physical illness. It's, in, it's associated with placement and poor life quality for the person with dementia, for the family. High care a burden, high care a depression. It's associated with lowering cognition and uh, increasing costs. It's a bad thing to have depression and dementia. So it is legitimate for us to want to treat depression and dementia. So here we have a trial that we carried out. This is the HTA SAD trial, study of depression in dementia, um, uh, which I led. Uh, and this is the uh, results from the study. The red line is sertraline, which is an antidepressant, which is commonly used for depression and dementia. The green is mirtazapine, which is another antidepressant that's commonly used for depression and dementia. And the red line is placebo, which is not giving either of those. And what you see is that there's absolutely no difference between any of those, okay? So there is no advantage to taking either of the active drugs compared to placebo. Quite a lot of people get better during this, but it's just that it's nothing to do with the drugs that people are taking. And this is not what we would have seen in older people with depression. And it's not what we would have seen in general. These are drugs that work, but they don't work for depression and dementia. What they do do is give you all the side effects you'd expect. So you've got twice the amount of side effects in those individuals. So we are seeing the absence of an effect that we would have expected and the presence of a side effect that we would have expected here. So what, do, you know, and it's not to do with the dose of drugs or the type of depression or dementia. It's because depression is different in dementia. We come back to the antipsychotics that we mentioned before. I mentioned that you had, we did this review and essentially what this shows is that there is a particular adverse event, a particular set of side effects, serious side effects, essentially an increase in death and an increase in severe cerebrovascular side effects, essentially strokes in those individuals that is again specific to dementia. So there's a, there's a, a side effect that we would not have expected. So here are four things that fly, yes? So they're all, the, so essentially the question is, just because it flies, does that make it a bird? Just because it looks like depression, does that mean it's depression? And the, fear, the reality is that there are more things that make you, you know, stop talking and perhaps be less socially withdrawn. Perhaps there are different things going on in a brain affected by Alzheimer's disease that might look like de depression, but isn't necessarily so. And you've got at least three groups. You've got a group where uh, you've essentially got an, an, uh, an analog of a reactive depression. It's a big and complicated thing for you to have a decrease in your cognition. And it's a big and complicated thing to be told that you have dementia. And it is perhaps explicable that, uh, that people feel a little depressed at that time. But also, it may well be that that then goes away if you provide people with the right sort of care and support. And there'll be a group of people where it looks like depression, but actually it may well be other brain systems and other, uh, other, other, other it may have a different biological basis. And so it would respond to a different treatment rather than the ones we have. And there are, of course, a group of people who carry their depression into later life and then have a further episode of that. But the dementia itself, the neuropathological changes may actually make that depression more difficult to treat. So what does it mean? It means that depression and psychosis are different 
in dementia that psychopharmacology is different in dementia. And actually, it's slightly strange to think that they wouldn't have been the same, that they would have been different, that they weren't different. And it means that we need to be very careful uh, in terms of both the effects and the potential harms when you are acting in a situation of complexity, as in multimorbidity, as in dementia, than when you are acting in a state of simplicity, that the rules are different in dementia. And some of you will have seen this slide before, but I like it very much to illustrate what I'm talking about. So what we have here is uh, Star Trek. Yeah, you aware of Star Trek in Canada? Okay. <laughs> but this is old school Star Trek here. This is the uh, old one here. And so what do we have? We have the chap at the top here. Who's he? The doctor, yeah, we've got a doctor here. So he's representing healthcare for us here. Okay, and we have, confusingly, someone who's called doctor, who's not a doctor. Yes, Dr. Spock. So he's got one of those PhDs, one of those proper doctorate things, but we'll forget about that. So what are they playing? What are they playing? Those look like chess pieces to me, yes? Are they playing chess? They're playing three-dimensional chess, okay? Because this is the year 2500 20, or whatever. This is the future. They're playing three-dimensional chess. But imagine for a moment that our friend, the doctor there, who represents healthcare services, he has been to all of the evidence-based chess move department courses. He knows his clinical guidelines for how you, uh, how you play chess but how you play two-dimensional chess, how you play the game in a condition of simplicity. If you play, you don't actually have to know the rules of three-dimensional chess to answer this question, by the way. But if you play three-dimensional chess using the rules of two-dimensional chess, who wins? No, the, all right, so is it Spock, who knows the rules of three-dimensional chess, who wins? Or is it McCoy, who doesn't know? Spock wins, doesn't he? Well, Spock would always win anyway, because he's brighter, isn't he? But if you forget that, if we play a game using the rules of a, using rules that are not the rules of the game that we're playing, we will tend to lose. So there's a thing that's always said about, um, about generals on battlefields, that they fight the last war. They, you know, they, they, they gear themselves up, they're fighting the last war, not the current war. And that means that they lose those wars. And it's obviously not ourselves that lose the game. We are playing, so the analogy is that we are playing a game of complexity. We are playing a 21st century game, which is one of multimorbidity and one of complexity, as exemplified by dementia. And we're trying to use the rules of the last century, which were all about treating single illnesses in otherwise well people in middle age. So we're using two-dimensional rules to play a three-dimensional game. And of course, it's not us that lose, it's our patients that lose. And that's why the people who end up staying in general hospitals are people who've got three things wrong with them. Because if you add the clinical guideline for treatment A and the clinical guideline for treatment B and the clinical guideline for treatment C together, what you end up with is a very ill individual who's being treated with a lot of mutually contradictory things. There's a paradox out there, which is that, you know, it's the, with the, the treatment of three things together isn't necessarily uh, those three treatments being given together. And in those areas where we need most information, we have left least information. We know loads about treating illnesses when people have only got one illness, because that's the paradigm that many randomized control trials are built around. We know very little about treating uh, you know, even heart disease in someone who's got diabetes and dementia. You know, how should you treat hypertension in an individual with Alzheimer's disease? Nobody knows. And yet we have to do that. And so you're working outside of those guidelines, and those guidelines may, uh, in effect, uh, cause more problems uh, than they cure. I'm going to finish just by talking about one other way that we might actually do something positive. And so this is the Time for Dementia program, which is a program that we've developed uh, in Brighton and Sussex in, in the south of England, funded by Health Education England. And this is all about trying to create the next generation of healthcare 
professionals as ones that are able to work out those rules of, of three-dimensional chess of 20, 21st century medicine to be able to create the solutions of the future. And essentially the program is an undergraduate medical pr uh, program, so it's investing in students now in order to provide better care in the future. Um, and the basic part of it is that our students, and this is not just medical students, it's, uh, it's been provided to 2,000 medical, nursing, paramedic, allied health professional students across Kent, Surrey and Sussex in the south of England. 1,300 families have taken part in Time for Dementia uh, to date, and it's being rolled out across other parts of England uh, this year as well. And essentially what we do is that our students are, are, uh, are introduced to a family that have dementia, to a person with dementia, and uh, the family carer of that individual, and they are the teachers for our students. Basically, our students learn from them what it's like to have dementia and what it is that health systems and social systems do or do not do for them. And uh, they put them, that enables them, because they see them every three months for two years, out of general hospitals in the people's own homes. It does two things, really. It enables those individuals to see the people as a whole, so they develop a whole sight of the person with dementia in their family, so they understand what families do, what it's like to be old and ill, and how sometimes what health systems do is just exactly the wrong thing for those individuals. And it makes them, it makes them engaged, and it makes them understand that family, and also it makes them want to change things for the better. It's a compulsory part of the curriculum, so it reaches the people who will work in, uh, who will work as anaesthetics and in intensive care units and orthopaedic wards, as well as those people who are, uh, uh, who are enlightened enough to decide to want to be geriatric psychiatrists. We've described the service. There's a good quality mixed methods evaluation that's part of it. Uh, we've got some data of people following it through. And I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the emerging data. This particularly looks at medical students uh, and compares our medical students receiving time for dementia with those of another medical school uh, where they didn't receive time dementia. And essentially, we create person-centeredness in our students, which is something that really isn't a very common thing to have created in medical students. So we change attitudes and understanding for the better. Uh, the qualitative work we do, it, uh, you'll see it's about challenging attitudes. People enhance their practice by being not afraid to talk to people with dementia. It makes people more optimistic about what to expect from people. Uh, it, it enables people to understand what families do and gets people thinking psychosocial uh, through relational learning. The families love it as well. The families feel they're making a difference. Uh, there's the altruistic part of it. But as I said, it's like I feel that whatever we do or say, they'll learn something from it, from me, and that's a person with dementia involved. You know, our students learn from those who understand these illnesses, which are the people with dementia and their carers. So, in short, I absolutely believe that we can, de we can develop, we can deliver these solutions that we need for uh, these 21st century challenges of dementia. And my last word is from uh, a, a stamp from the United States. Uh, th and this is the challenge that we all face. The trouble with life or with working with dementia isn't that there's no answer, it's there's so many answers. There's already so much that we can do. There's so much that needs to be done. So thank you all and thank you very much and good luck in your work with dementia.